In the name of Jesus, amen. If you get a chance to peruse my January newsletter article, you will read the shock I experienced at how quickly the culture around us has thrown off the smackings and trappings of Christmas this year. Apparently, when the festivals uh, and festivities begin on the heels of Halloween, as I mentioned at the beginning of Advent, you're ready to get rid of the elongated Yule Tide. The Curtis family concluded our observance of Christmas on the 12th day of Christmas yesterday with Meg's family. Today, we will dismantle the tree, pack up the beauty of, for this year, and make our way back into ordinary time. The same is true for the church. Christmas came sneaking in on us by candlelight on December 24th. We've had 12 full days to contemplate the arrival of the Christ child. We've seen Joseph, the protector, and the virgin mother mild. We've run off to Bethlehem with shepherds, and now today we celebrate the fullness of Jesus' identity when kings from the east arrive to worship this tiny child. We give thanks that the child born in Bethlehem is indeed the Jewish Messiah, but also the Savior of the whole world. Nevertheless, if you're anything like the world around you, you wish that we'd quit singing Christmas carols already. You're surprised to see the nativity still on display, and you're just as disappointed that the poinsettias are still in resplendent array. You're ready to be done with Christmas! the cookies, and all the cheer. It's time to start eating right and working out and getting started on whatever other resolutions you've made. You're thinking, this is the year. You're planning to really make something of yourself, tackling all those other, well, you know, untouched projects from resolutions past and accomplish the impossible, which cannot be completed, obviously, but who am I to judge? Well, you're in for a real disappointment this morning. If you thought church was going to be the pick-me-up you've really come to expect, the readings anticipate a very different outcome. If you were hoping to find self-motivation among us, you've come to the wrong place. Ezekiel the prophet has been hanging around a group of folks who were deported and dispersed because of their sinful disobedience. The exiled Israelites' hope was dried up and lost. So the Spirit offered a fantastical vision, and the hand of the Lord dropped Ezekiel into a frightful valley of mass graves. As far as the eye can see, Ezekiel could only see bones purged of their flesh and sinew, dried up and deserted. You haven't even made it a full week into your New Year's resolution, and I'm going to posit this statement. The image of the dry bones is the image of you and your resolution. Oh yeah, you'll give it your best shot. You might even be able to give the illusion of life, just as happened in Ezekiel's prophecy. You might be able to rattle the bones into some sort of order and give them coverings, but what you'll have is only a lifeless corpse. All your best efforts will fall flat. Nothing you can do will bring about the better, new, and improved self. All their personal investment and your individual striving will still leave you lacking. The wise men from the east are the perfect example of such an endeavor. They had followed the star, traveled all that way, but when they arrived in Jerusalem, they had to ask for directions. The astrologers had read the skies and interpreted the stars, but when they arrived, the newborn king was nowhere to be found. They turned to a murderous king who offered his help under selfish motivations. Ah, yes, you can celebrate their search. You may honor them for the thoughtfulness of their gifts. But even their eventual find, their worship, and their return home by another way still resulted in more death than life. 
so here you are, a bag of bones wandering to and fro in this old world of sin. Your resolution, however noble, cannot bring about the lasting change you've been hoping for. Like the Magi, you can go on the greatest search the culture around you can offer, that search for self-discovery. Yet in the end, you will find yourself completely off course and possibly making deals with those things that steal life and serve death. Furthermore, the gravesite vision of our prophecy reading today reminds us that all of our bodies are wasting away. With the turn of the year, time itself is marching us all on to death. It's a pretty hopeless situation when you're left to yourself and your own devices. But what happens? What happens when God gives his word? What happens when God keeps his promises and restores the fortunes of Zion? What happens when his very breath, which was breathed into the words of prophets and apostles, is set loose in the world? What happens when misguided magi stop to confer with the chief priests and the scribes of the people? It seems to me that life happens. Not the kind of life that we shuffle through or suffer our way through. This is not the life that keeps rolling on with every turn of the year. This is not the life that we have been trying to repair with our various resolutions. No, where God's word is read and heard and preached, God unleashes life for you. As Luther wrote in his explanation to the third commandment, God's word is the treasure that sets everything apart and by which all people are made into saints, God's chosen people. By God's word, bones become believers. Bones adorned with tendons and skin are restored and become a living, breathing, and mighty army standing at the ready waiting to worship the Lord and do his will. Magi from the east become one of the first congregations of Christ. Kings and peasants kneel down before the one of whom it is said, in him was life, and the life was the light of men. As Christmas draws to a close and a new year begins, you might have ambitions of seeking personal happiness climbing the corporate ladder, or finally stumbling upon the meaning of life. But eventually those endeavors will lead you into the hands of the many worlds, Herod-like villains, who seek to rob you of the God-given gift of life. In your resolve and your striving, you will work yourself to the bone, and then they will still be laid out with all those who have succumbed to the world's allure. But that might not be all that bad. While holiness has begun and your faith is growing every day, Luther writes, you can expect that your flesh with all its sinful desires will be destroyed and buried with all its uncleanness. And then you will come forth gloriously and arise as a new creation in eternal life, in perfect holiness. For now you are only half holy and pure, so the Holy Spirit has some reason always to continue his work in us through the word. By the power of the Spirit, your effort and reason and strength are debunked. What then is left in its place? The word of God alone for you. This life-giving word on the voice of the Spirit enters your ear and strikes the heart. It calls kings from afar and nations to the brightness of your rising. It raises bones to stand in newness of life, for you have a God who calls into existence the things that do not exist. 
You cannot leave the manger of the Messiah only to muddle your way through another year of aging and changing. Instead, this encounter with God's word made flesh has called you to faith that leads to life. And when this life runs out, faith will become sight. And that same word that sustained you here will open your graves and raise you from the dead. And then you will live in the joy and blessedness forever. Thanks be to God. Amen.